Welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. This week, I'm talking with Ali Acock Patterson, Lens Rentals Head of Video Product Development, about which pieces of video gear a beginner should pick up first. If you're just getting started in video, maybe just got out of film school, and you're wondering where to start before you look for freelance jobs, these are our recommendations. All you'll need after this is a little luck and a huge backpack. Allie, good morning. Thank you for joining me. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, So what we want to talk today uh, is the 10 pieces of video gear you should buy first. I guess the idea here is if you're a beginner and you kind of don't know where to start, uh, what to prioritize, these are the things we think you should pick up uh, when you start. And at number one, I think we want to start with the obvious, which is a camera. And this is a really broad category, probably the hardest thing to nail down and like recommend a single product. But in general, feature wise, what do you think is non-negotiable? Well, if you're trying to buy the gear, obviously it's going to be whatever you can afford. And so sometimes that means buying used gear as opposed to brand new gear. There's still a lot of cameras out there that stay relevant years and years later. I mean, I think people are still shooting with the 5D Mark II probably somewhere in the world. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. But there are some if you're you know, specific to video, there are some features you want to look at. Do you want a fixed lens camera versus interchangeable lenses? And then features I like to look at specifically are like XLR inputs. Uh, what are your video outputs, HDMI versus SDI? Connectability, I think, is really important when you start looking at the big picture because video goes in so many different directions. Uh, yes, like you mentioned, I think the first choice anybody is going to have to make at the most basic level is a fixed lens or interchangeable lens camera. And I think, at least, uh, unless I were a beginner in a very particular type of videography, say sports videography or event videography, I would go with an interchangeable lens at this point. Um, I think that's the the clearest first choice to make. Would you agree? Absolutely. You get a lot more mileage out of a fixed lens camera and they're typically a little bit cheaper, but you are also going to be limited to, like you said, very specific work. You're not going to be looking at a whole lot of narrative work if you're doing, you know, if you're shooting with a fixed lens. Uh, As far as inputs and outputs goes, a requirement would definitely be HDMI or SDI. You're unlikely to find a camera at this point anywhere without at least an HDMI port, but I would look for SDI. If I can, Um, typically a camera with an SDI port is going to be a little bit more expensive, but it's worth it in the long run. Can you talk a little bit, Allie, about the differences between HDMI and why you would maybe prefer one over the other? Yeah. So, um, you know, SDI, the biggest piece of it is that you've got that BNC connector. So you've got a locking connection. There's no question about whether or not your cable is correctly connected. And also with the, with an HDMI connection, you know, they're great for your TV, something that's not moving around as much. But if you are, if you've got any kind of dynamic shot going on with your camera, that HDMI connection is going to be more likely to get bent. You've got a lot of, you know, tiny pins sitting inside. So the more the cable moves, the more prone to damage they're going to be. Right. And as far as audio goes, I personally would say XLR, XLR inputs, I would consider non-negotiable, though there, I'm sure there are plenty of people shooting professional projects on cameras that don't have XLR inputs. What would you go with, Ali, personally? Um, would you be okay starting with a camera at this point that didn't have XLR inputs? I mean, again, it kind of depends on your budget. If you're shooting on like a DSLR or a mirrorless system, there are usually some kind of adapter. You can get like a Tascam that you can put in between your camera and your audio feed. So you have preamps and stuff. You're still going to feed in through a 3.5 millimeter cable. And then some manufacturers have actually come up with XLR adapters. But once you build all this stuff out, sometimes you're looking at the same price for a camcorder that already features some of these connections. And XLR, I do think is important. It's the same concept as the BNC versus an HDMI cable. You know, a 3.5 millimeter jack is just you plug it in, you pull it out. There's no locking feature to it as opposed to XLR, where once you have it in, you're connected, you're locked in tight. You don't have to worry about cables slipping out and you losing your feed. Another thing that I think is important to consider, especially for people who are using DSLR mirrorless cameras, is going to be um, recording limitations. 
Uh, I know a lot of cameras are starting to get away from that, but more often than not, if you're shooting with a camera designed for photo work, you're going to have a limitation on how long of a video clip you can record. So sometimes that's great if you're a very disciplined shooter, but uh, if you're doing, say, an interview, you don't want to have to cut something off at a an emotional peak just so that you can start recording again. You know, you never want to have to cut someone off and say, oh, well, we have to start a new clip. You want to be able to roll for as long as you need to. And especially as a beginner, you may think, well, okay, I'm going to make commercials or I'm going to make short films. I will never need to run a take longer than 30 minutes. But if you're freelancing at all, you have to consider that as a requirement. You might get a job that's like, hey, shoot my wedding and like let a camera run for the whole ceremony or shoot this event that I'm having. And you don't want to have to turn down those jobs because you can't record for longer than 30 minutes. Nope, because a lot of times that's where the money is in those jobs. I mean, 100 <laughs> percent. Nobody's going to pay you for short films. So you need, <laughs> exactly. you need to be able to do any kind of work you're, you can pick up. You have to take the jobs you have to so you can do the jobs you want. Uh, let's talk about number two, the next thing a beginner should pick up, which is a lens that'll go on your camera. And first of all, you'll obviously need a lens that mount that matches the mount on your camera. But second of all, the question you have to answer, I think first is zoom or prime. Would you recommend a zoom lens or a prime lens as the first kind of beginner lens for somebody who just bought a camera? Personally, I really like shooting um, on cinema lenses. So to not totally break the bank, you're going to be looking at a prime lens. Obviously, with a zoom lens, you're going to get a lot more out of a single lens. But if you're looking, say, at like a Canon 24 to 70, you know, you're not going to be able to zoom in and out and keep your focal point. If you're using a photo lens, you're not going to have a par focal lens typically, which is where you zoom, you know, let's say you zoom to something in the background, you pull it into focus. And as you zoom into a wider shot, that focus is going to slip a little bit if you're not using a par focal lens. However, par focal lenses are crazy expensive usually. So if you're trying to go for something that, you know, just a small little camera package, I'd say something like a, a Make lenses. They're the Vedra replacements, something like that that's not too expensive, but a little bitty, you know, manual focus, manual everything cinema lens. Okay, perfect. This is this is where we'll start to vary, I think. Um, <laughs> and it's not uh, this is an important thing to remember as we go through this whole list is that for none of these categories, is there like a correct, objective, right answer? Uh, it's just, you know, the kind of work you produce. And for me, I work a lot in documentary. I think a zoom lens is absolutely essential for that type of work. If you're out in the field and uh, you're kind of just shooting what's happening around you and you don't have time to change lenses quickly, I think something like a 24 to 70 would be my personal first go to. But again, that's just up to the kind of work you're making. Right. And I'm sure in the world of video, there are more people shooting on 24 to 70s than a Make lens or any video, you know, zoom lens. Or 16 to 35, you know, 16 to 35, 24 to 70, and 70 to 200 are probably the most commonly used lenses. To answer, I think, the next question in a lens selection, how fast at minimum do you think a starter lens should be? That's a really tough one um, because I am kind of a snob. I'd say generally I go 2.8. I agree. But I think a lot of, you know, F4 is probably decent for a lot of stuff. Um, for me, I just want a fixed aperture. I don't want a variable aperture. Yes, 100%. If you're buying a zoom lens, I would definitely spend the extra money to get something with a, a consistent, constant rather, uh, aperture. And I guess a little bit about what that means for beginners. Uh, a more affordable, I'll say, rather than cheaper, zoom <laughs> lens will typically have a variable aperture, meaning the aperture will close down as you zoom in, so you might see something like a, I don't know, 24 to 200 and the aperture reading will have two numbers rather than just saying like F4, it'll say like F4 to F5, 6 or whatever. Meaning uh, if you're wide open at an F4 and you're at the widest focal length, say 24 and you zoom into 200, your aperture is going to close down to 5.6 meaning you can't zoom in while recording, really, because it'll affect the exposure on your image. 
a fixed or excuse me, constant aperture zoom stays the same throughout the zoom range. So like a 24 to 70 F 2.8 or a 24 to 105 F 4, uh, those uh, lenses will not affect exposure as you zoom in and out. I think 2.8 at the fastest is the best sweet spot. As you're, I would say, ideally, you want to be recording at at least an F4, F5, 6, especially if you're alone and you're pulling your own focus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but you might need to open it up to 2.8 occasionally if you know, you're shooting in a somewhat darker environment. But like starting at an F4, I, I, would, I would want that extra speed on the wider end. Right. Uh, I guess we'll move on to number three, which is recording media. And I, I don't have a lot to say about this beyond the fact that you should not cheap out on recording media. No, never cheap out on media. Yeah. And this isn't on our list because it's it's kind of unspoken, but I would say the same thing for batteries. I would lump oh, yeah. those two in together. I think a lot of people early try to save money by buying like CVS brand SD cards <laughs> that end up just being way more trouble than they're worth. And like third party batteries on Alibaba from some company you've never heard of. It's really, truly best to just spend the extra money. I know it sucks, but bite the bullet and buy brand name recording media and batteries from the same company that made your camera. It's w- worth it. I concur. And as far as media is concerned, I mean, there are lots of options out there. You don't necessarily always have to have the most expensive option either, but you kind of have to weigh your options of price of your media versus price of data recovery. And data recovery is always going to be more expensive. (laughs) Right. Or the price of just irrecoverably losing a job you've shot, which is that's the worst not something you can fix. So yeah, just like look into what you're getting, make sure it's from a reliable source. And I guess second, I would start with at least two cards. And we we say this to customers all the time. It is much better to, you know, purchase or rent say two 128 gigabyte cards than one 256 gigabyte card. You want to be able to spread your shooting day across uh, multiple cards within reason. I'm not, you know, I wouldn't buy 32 four gigabyte cards. Uh, (laughs) but if you can help it, you don't want to count on one massive card working all the time. You want to be able to split it across multiple cards, which I guess brings us to number four on our list, which is an external hard drive. And this is higher on the list than some, you know, go-to equipment people might think of immediately. This is before a lot of other gear, uh, specifically to drive home the point that it is very important to back up your footage all the time and never not do it. <laughs> Correct. You should have a library of external drives at home. Yes. Always do it. Never not do it. I mean, I actually go so far as to put it in my contracts. If um, I'm working with a client or if I hire someone for post-production, I put it in my contract that they have to house the complete footage for a period of time. If I'm hiring someone, it's usually six months. If I'm doing the job, I usually minimum of 18 months, just in case they ever need to go back and see something or they, for whatever reason, it's just a good idea to keep it backed up, to keep it on hand and to keep it readily available for a period of time. That's a really, really great idea. And this is getting a little bit off of our like gear point, but if I had a number 11 on this list, it would be... <laughs> <laughs> a book about basic contract law. Oh my God, it's so difficult to understand. I actually took a law class in college because I realized we were not covering the business side of filmmaking when I was in art school. <laughs> that is so smart. I wish I had done exactly the same thing and I didn't and I've been burned more times than I care to remember. That's actually The most important piece of advice I would give like a beginner freelance filmmaker graduating from film school right now is look into contract law and sign a a contract. Yeah. Take a basic business course. None of this stuff is complicated. You don't have to write contracts. They're normally just available from some online service. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. You just fill in like Mad Libs, the details (laughs) of what you want to agree on. And it's, it's easy. And if you don't do it, it will come back to haunt you eventually. It's inevitable. Okay, back to the gear. All right. 
next on the list, number five, uh, tripod. And this is another pretty obvious one. And um, luckily, I do think this is a place where you can save a little bit of money. I, I think tripod technology has honestly reached its peak. And there's not a lot of, there aren't really. Like a hundred years ago? Reached yeah, its peak. It, these things are what they have been for a long time. And I don't think you need to necessarily pay for a ton of new features. I'm sure you can find a used tripod. I, I guess the only question you really have to answer is fluid head or ball head. And if we're talking video equipment, you should absolutely buy a fluid head tripod. And Ali, can you explain the difference between a fluid head and a ball head tripod? Yeah. So um, a ball head is, I'm using my hands to talk, which isn't very effective on a podcast, but um, you know, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's usually going to be just um, a little cylinder with a ball on it that holds a, usually a fairly small um, camera plate that is designed for you to put the camera at a certain angle and kind of lock your shot down. Um, a fluid head is going to usually, and it depends, I guess, from one manufacturer to the other, how well these features actually work. But a fluid head is going to be designed for you to be able to pan and tilt your shot so that you're not locked down. And it's going to uh, typically have some kind of adjustable resistance so that, you know, on a ball head, there's not going to be anything that if you unlock your shot, it's just kind of going to flop one way or the other. If you're on a fluid head, you're going to be able to have those smoother shots, um, you know, more, as it says, more fluidly pan and tilt your shot where you're not going to see it just kind of flop around. That said, you also, something a lot of people don't realize, you do kind of have to find your balancing point on tripods. If you have a completely off balance rig, it doesn't really matter how much resistance you put on, you're going to be fighting your camera. You're going to risk having kind of a sloppy looking shot. But again, from one manufacturer to the other, how well these features work is going to vary. Yeah, as long as you're going with a trusted name, which is kind of a that's a through line through all of this. Don't buy anything from a company you've never heard of. Uh, <laughs> don't you buy know, a Walmart tripod. Yes, exactly. Uh, don't buy some like Pro Video Express tripod <laughs> uh, like uh, get something with like some genuine reviews and you know do your research but you don't have to spend a ton of money on a tripod if you can find something used that's been well taken care of from like manfrotto or sackler somebody like that and you know depending on your budget you might not be able to go with like a carbon fiber or whatever but you will be thankful that you spent the extra money if you get something lightweight versus some very old tripod made of steel that weighs 100 pounds because again, if we're talking to somebody who's a beginner, you're likely just going to be carrying your own gear around. Right. Also something, it's, you know, it's the little things that I really like. Um, I really like tripods that have, or I guess fluid heads, um, that have a backlit bubbling uh, feature. Yeah, that's hugely important and should be something that's like in the specs on B&H. A, a spirit level in general, there are some fluid heads that exist. I, I'm sure it's rare. I hope it's rare. But there are some fluid heads that just don't have a spirit level at all. So, yeah, I'd say that's crucial. Yes, absolutely. Get something with a spirit level. And if you're unfamiliar with this, you've probably seen it before. It's like a this is a, I'm finding difficult to describe. It's <laughs> you see a, it in construction work all the time. Yeah, exactly. In like a, a level that you would use to like make sure, I don't know, a, a table or a shelf is level. Um, It's like a. A little plastic ball filled with liquid and a bit of air that makes a bubble. And you can tell whether whatever you're trying to measure is level by whether the bubble lines up with these like two lines or in the case of a spirit level, a circle. Uh, so on a tripod, that's used to make sure that if you say have your tripod on ground that isn't level, you can adjust the head uh, to counter that and get a level shot. Uh, so, yeah, make sure your tripod has a spirit level. And that it's backlit. It's handy if you're shooting at night. You don't want to get like a flashlight out. And uh, on that note, I think we'll take a quick break. And when we get back, we'll go through numbers six through ten. If you only know lens rentals from our yelling about cameras on the Internet, there's more to the story. We're actually the largest online videography and photography equipment rental house in the entire world. Cameras, lenses, lights, audio, drones, just about anything. Here's how it works. Just go to lensrentals.com and tell us what you need and when you need it. We ship it straight to you in protective cases. 
You use it for whatever your heart desires, then ship it back to us with the included return label. Next time you need equipment for a shoot, head to lensrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your order. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. Welcome back to the Lens Rentals podcast. I'm talking with Ali Acock patterson about the 10 pieces of video gear you should buy first. Uh, and we are on number six, which is an ND filter. And for those who are unfamiliar, Ali, I'm wondering if you can describe the purpose of an ND filter. Uh, sunglasses for your camera. That's the best way to describe <laughs> it. That's exactly right. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, some cameras have them built in that you can drop in. Some of them have mechanical, some of them have electronic. But if you're not working with a camera that has any kind of built in neutral density filter, you need to probably source an external option because, you know, you'll never really realize quite how bright some days can be until you're trying to stop down your camera and realize that you are killing your shot. Right. And there's a lot less flexibility in controlling exposure on the video side than there is in photo. So I would say an indie filter is even more necessary if you're a videographer. Uh, I think people may think of it as, um, I don't know, a photo accessory. And it's really more helpful for video because you I agree. can't really, without making your footage look weird, you can't adjust your shutter speed in video. Right. So if you're shooting outdoors and you want to shoot at like a 2.8 or a 4, you want to get some nice depth of field, the only way to really control your exposure, because you don't really want to mess with your ISO too much either, if you can help it, is to adjust your aperture. And adjusting your aperture is going to affect your depth of field. So if you want nice, creamy depth of field uh, in an outdoor shot, you kind of need an ND filter to uh, change that exposure. Right. And this is where having a photo lens is really going to save you some money. You can have one lens, like a 24 to 70. You're only going to have to think about one filter size to invest in. You can get a couple cheap ND filters and stack them um, so that you have more options for your filter factor, uh, which I don't think a lot of people realize. If you are investing in, if you're trying to save some money and you're investing in a single strength filter, Make sure that it's got threads on both sides so that you can buy two or three different strengths and stack them if you need to. Right, exactly. And then the alternative to that would be uh, what's called a variable ND filter, uh, which is essentially a, a, a single filter that is adjustable in strength. Usually a little bit more expensive, but... Yes, exactly. Um, but it is it is more uh, more flexible in that you can kind of continuously adjust it. Uh, so really just whatever fits in your budget, though. Uh, if you can't swing a variable ND filter, a few single power ND filters should do fine. All right. Number seven on our list. Uh, and this one's this is our broadest category because we couldn't decide what to make it. This is just off tripod support and is another one that really, really just depends a lot on the type of uh, work you're doing. We have this split up into four types. So a cage, a shoulder mount, a stabilizer, or a slider. One of those four things, whichever you think would be most important to you, should be your next purchase after an ND filter. And I'm wondering, Ali, if you can kind of talk about which of these options would be the best for which type of project. So... You know, it kind of depends. I think if I were starting out, I would probably go, honestly, with a slider. Um, they're really inexpensive. It doesn't take a lot of experience to get the look down. You do want to make sure that you don't get a super cheap slider because how smooth of a track you have is going to determine how clean your shot looks. But sliders, I mean, they're great for all kinds of shots, interviews, uh, Anything that you just need to give a slightly different dynamic, something that you can't accomplish with a tripod. After that, I'd probably say a shoulder mount, but getting a feel for, you know, that look is a little more, is a little rougher. Um, and so it's going to lend itself to a very specific shooting style, unless your camera has some kind of amazing in-camera stabilization or your lens has some kind of great image stabilization. And even then you're probably, you know, it's going to look like a handheld shot. Cages probably my third option. They might be a little more complicated. They will give you better angles usually. 
And then finally, stabilizers, even though I shoot with them more than anything else on this list, they're going to be a little bit more expensive. Yeah, and require a little bit more expertise to use. I mean, it's definitely becoming more and more common. I shot a commercial probably at this point two or three years ago. And except for one or two shots, we were on a stabilizer the whole time. And so it really does give you a lot of flexibility, uh, especially if you're trying to knock out a lot of locations at once uh, because you don't have to constantly set up your tripod, level it. Once your stabilizer is set up, you're pretty much good to go. You might have to do a little fine tuning throughout the day. But again, you're paying for that convenience. Yeah, no, that's true. Especially if you have a operator who really knows what they're doing, it can kind of stand in for something more traditional like a dolly or a slider. It doesn't always have to be the kind of shot I'm picturing that I hate, which is just like needlessly sprinting through some set. I'm not saying there's not a place for it. I like when it's when a stabilizer like that is used well, it's really dynamic and cool and you can get some shots that you just objectively can't get with a shoulder mount or a slider. But I would say don't rush into it. And I agree with you that I think a slider is probably a better choice for a beginner. Um, Really just anything that can add motion to your shots, just make things a little bit more dynamic and really ups the production value and makes the work you're producing look a lot more expensive than if it was just shot on a tripod. Right. And if you are using a slider, this is also going to be a point where you really look into the quality of your tripod because you're going to want something that you can remove the head and sandwich a slider between the legs and the head. And you want the legs to be able to support the weight of your slider, the head, and your camera and lens. Yeah, 100%. You're going to need a tripod that can handle a lot more weight than just your camera, especially depending on the length of your slider. If you've got it on one far end or the other, you don't want your tripod to fail. Because then your whole rig is probably broken. And that's not ideal because you're on a budget, we've established. (laughs) Right. All right. Number eight. We'll move on to number eight on our list, which is either a shotgun or a lav mic. And the only note I have for this is whichever works best for the work you're producing. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between these two? Sure. So a lav mic is going to be um, the kind you see on the news, basically, where you clip it onto someone's lapel. You can also tape it to skin. Um, Some people put it in hair. You see it a lot in um, broadcast and in theater type applications. But depending on how many people you want to be able to pick up speaking, You know, you've got to have a kit per person usually, and then you've got to have, you know, a camera. Usually you're going to have two XLR inputs at most. So if you've got more than two people, now you're looking having to get a mixer and uh, it can get pretty expensive pretty quick. So a shotgun is definitely going to be a more versatile option. And then different shotguns, you know, depending on the length or whether or not they have like a frequency dial of some sort are going to be better served in be- different applications. Right. I, I think a, a shotgun is probably more flexible, uh, like usable in more different recording situations. For sure. But a lav mic, especially if you're doing any kind of documentary work, and I keep saying documentary, but I don't necessarily only mean like producing a straight documentary. Like if you're if you're producing low budget commercials, you're likely going to have to do some documentary style stuff, talking head interviews, or even just shooting on location. That's the kind of thing I mean. So if you're into commercial production, you're probably going to have to interview somebody at some point. And that's where a lav mic is kind of irreplaceable. If I was only going to get one of these, I would probably go with a shotgun. Would you agree? Yes. But yeah, my second purchase uh, would be a lav, definitely. And if you can afford to get both at the same time, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, if you've got two XLR inputs, go ahead and get a shotgun and a lav so that you can pick up audio from everywhere. Yeah, and on an interview, I generally prefer to use both on the same subject. If I'm only interviewing one person, shotgun on a boom pole and then a lav mic on the subject, and then just you have two tracks in case something happens. Correct. Uh, Next on the list, this is the one I'm most excited about. Because it's, I think, the least obvious choice uh, is a reflector, a five-in-one reflector. And I would absolutely purchase a reflector before I purchase a light, even if I'm doing like talking head interview stuff. Well, I guess we should start by explaining what a five-in-one reflector is. 
What all is in the five in one? Uh, I believe it's gold tone reflection, silver tone reflection, white reflection, diffusion. So the okay, yeah, the like center of the hoop itself is kind of a, a semi-transparent white, and then uh, a flag. black. Yeah, okay, yeah, which is just a fully block light. Usually they're circular, and usually they uh, sort of fold and pop out. They fold into a tighter circle so you can fit it into like a backpack uh, and then it um, unfolds into about, I don't know, usually they come in different sizes, but usually they're about the size of like a hula hoop. Yeah. Uh, and it's a it's a frame that includes kind of a zipper cover that you can flip inside and out and reflect and adjust existing light, which is hugely important for a beginner, especially again, if you're working in any sort of documentary situation, you are likely going to be working at least primarily with existing light that's already at your location. And so being able to uh, sculpt that light and make adjustments without having to bring in your own lights, which might not be doable time wise or budget wise is super, super helpful. And right. these things, I don't know, they cost like what, $50? They're not crazy expensive. I'm actually looking it up on our website right now, and it's like 30 bucks. Yeah. So you can probably find a nice one on like, I don't know, B&H or whatever for certainly less than $70. Well, in talking about lighting, so if you were to introduce a video light, finding a light that you're going to be able to blend into your other lighting available on location is going to be more expensive. If you mm -hmm. don't, want to spend the money on a light that you can blend into your available lighting, then you're looking at a minimum of a three light kit. You're looking at light stands and all kinds of other stuff. Whereas, you know, if you have a reflector, it really is a smart suggestion, Ryan. And I honestly had never thought about it for video work, but yeah, you just have a little thing that you pop up and toss a little light where you need it and you're good to go. The highest praise I can give it is that, you know, we get free rentals here. So I don't own any equipment for my own weekend projects. I just rent everything from lens rentals. Like I own media and hard drives and stuff, but I don't own a camera. I don't own a tripod. I don't own a light, just about anything. A reflector is nearly the only piece of video equipment I own myself just because I use it on every shoot. It's indispensable. And lastly, we'll end with number 10, which is a monitor. Then this will obviously depend on which camera you use, but I think likely we're talking HDMI monitor. I think likely most people's first camera is going to be HDMI only, probably. Probably against our advice. Yes. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, <laughs> it's easy to give that advice to be like, you should go with SDI because it's so clearly better. And it is, but. But we the, just upped your budget by about a grand. Yeah. The money difference is I, I can understand it not being worth a locking connection to have to pay for a camera that's like twice as expensive. So anyway, we're probably talking about an HDMI monitor. And at this point, I can't think of a brand I would recommend to a beginner other than small HD. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely cheaper brands out there, but, you know, they're all pretty much just small HD knockoffs. Yeah. And I, I found, I think, you know, I don't have ex experience with every monitor on the market, but I've found small HD to be a really nice compromise between cost and reliability. Yeah, I agree with that completely. They don't go out on us very often. They have a ton of different options for like different use cases, which I think is really handy. They have versions with SDI without. So if you don't want to pay for SDI connections, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I can't really think of a, a monitor I would prefer to use. Even going all the way back to like the AC7, which has been around for as long as I've worked here. So seven plus years. And we still have them in rotation because they just work and they're not that expensive. I think if I were looking for a monitor to purchase right now, my number one factor would be uh, brightness, which I don't think is something people immediately consider. But like I would rather have a 720p monitor that was bright enough to be visible in sunlight than like a 4K monitor that I can't see outdoors. And I, I don't want to have to deal with monitor hoods and all that stuff. I, I want something that's just bright and viewable outside. I agree with that. Um, monitor hoods are great if it's just you. But if you, you know, have a client that wants to look over your shoulder every once in a while, which is pretty common, then you want to have a monitor that is 
I'd say at least five inches or larger, the screen at least. You also probably want to have a option, you know, tools that a monitor can do are pretty important. You know, peaking, histograms, of course, now we're going exponentially more expensive, but also what kind of battery type they take is important. Yeah, a lot of the small HD battery, uh, a lot of the like beginner level small HD monitors take uh, Canon batteries, which is handy. So if you're shooting on like a 5D3 or whatever, your monitor could take the same batteries as your camera, which is handy. Especially at the budget level we're talking about, you're not going to find something that's going to be just 100% color accurate, studio reference capable monitor that you're also going to want to just slap on top of your camera and take out into the field. I would, I would say color accuracy is not all that important beyond it just accurately, somewhat accurately reflecting the shot that you're framing up. Let's is another big one, especially if you're working with a client, because I tend to shoot and log. And so if a client sees what my camera view is, they think I've lost my mind because they don't know what they're looking at. For those of you who are just starting out. So if a monitor view is important to your client and you're shooting and log, there's going to be very little contrast and very little color that the client's going to see. So you want to let, which is a lookup table. It's just a um, overlay basically of your image that'll show what the image will look like once it's been color corrected. I hope that made sense. That absolutely made sense. Yeah. If you, if you're shooting log and just sending log to your monitor, your client is going to think, wow, the shot looks very off. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very low contrast, very low saturation. And then a lot either you can make a custom LUT that accurately reflects the color correction you're planning on applying, or you can use just kind of like an off the shelf generic LUT, like a, I don't know, like a Canon C log three to rec seven Oh nine. That'll just <laughs> adjust your, adjust the log look to a color profile that your client is, you know, more uh, used to seeing. Yeah. And I think at least every small HD monitor, at least every small HD monitor that's made within the last like five or six years, uh, supports LUTs. Correct. Not the AC sevens. Those are too old, but everything right. since I'm pretty, the five Oh two and forward. But all their new monitors are perfectly capable. I think it's the it's the only like really specific product recommendation I'm going to get into on this list because everything else, you know, just depends so much on your needs. But I think anybody in any different type of work would be happy with a small HD like 502. Right. Uh, Well, that is it for our list Um, beyond number 11, which we mentioned already, which is take a contract law class. I'll hit that again. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Uh, Learn a little bit about business because you know, if your client is working from a business perspective, chances are they know better about contracts than you do. All right. That'll do it, Allie. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Lens Rentals podcast. We'll put links in the show notes for all the products we discussed. And if there's a topic or piece of equipment you're interested in that we didn't cover here, our techs are always happy to help. Even if you don't order anything, they'll gladly talk through gear recommendations anytime. Just call 901-754-9100 or email support at lensrentals.com. The Lens Rentals podcast is a production of lensrentals.com. If you've got a question or topic you'd like covered on the show, email us at podcast at lensrentals.com or leave us a voicemail at 901-609-LENS. That's 901-609-LENS. If you're enjoying the show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe in your podcast app of choice. Make sure to check the show notes for a link to this week's coupon code. And as always, Roger Sakala will leave you with an inspirational quote. The world is a stage, and the play is badly cast. Oscar Wilde